My name's Natalie Borman, and I um, have a studio that originally was a one-room schoolhouse um, built for African-American children who live in this neighborhood. It's located about two and a half miles west of Carboro. And um, I, my husband and I bought, built, well, we bought it actually about 20-some um, oh, years ago and restored it and are trying to make it be as authentically much like it was when it was a schoolhouse. Um, so the original part was built right where I'm standing, which is around 1907. And uh, about 20 years later, they added on another part, which uh, it, there's a beam right there, and um, they added it on uh, around probably early, around 1930. So this is um, a wonderful place I've enjoyed working uh, as my clay studio for the last um, 20 years or so, and I, um, this part, um, we've done quite a bit of work inside and outside in this building, um, and as I said, this was um, originally a schoolhouse, uh, and it functioned as a schoolhouse until 1965, uh, when the schools were integrated, and the children in this neighborhood, and this neighborhood is historically a black neighborhood and um, the, then in around 1965 the kids were bused into Chapel Hill and this school became something else and, and since 1965 it's functioned it been for several different reasons. It was a daycare center and it was a church for a while and it was um, even a nightclub and um, for the last 20 some years before my husband and I bought it, it uh, was a residence for a guy and his son. So they made it into sort of a home-like place. And when we bought it, um, we decided to take out some of the structures that they had built into it so we could make it more open. And we loved the openness of it. And I also am a psychotherapist and sometimes, and <clears throat> when I see clients, I see them in this little circle of chairs. So it's a nice atmosphere for Clients who come here for psychotherapy, I've been told by many of them that they like the non-traditional atmosphere here. And um, as you'll see, I, um, I hand build pottery so I don't create a lot of mess with the, that a wheel might create in an interior uh, space like this. So and I use a pinch pot method. And I um, got into it, I think, because I like the slowness of it and the meditativeness of it, and each pot actually takes me quite a while to build. I can show you how I got, um, how I started pot, if you'd like me to do that. I have, I have changed over the years, but I use basically the same method, and I, I guess I, I like this method because, one, it's slow, and when I first got into it, I thought, why should I make a um, something out of clay and do it on the wheel because it'll look like it came out of a store instead of an old, lumpy, <laughs> more asymmetrical shape that my pinch pots are. That was my reasoning. And I realize a lot of wheel thrown pottery is much more unique than, you know, than something that you could buy in any store, you know, mass produced. But I do like this method because it um, gives me a lot of contact with the clay and, it, and it's actually very relaxing. Um, Usually what I do is I shape a, a piece of clay into a ball. And if I want it to be a round pot, I mean, a, like pretty much all my pots are round. Some are more different shapes, some are oblong, but mostly I start with a round ball. So I get one going like this. This isn't round enough yet. I'll try to get it round. And this is actually really good exercise for my hands. I had somebody ask me if it was hard on my hands or not, and I don't think it is. I'm getting a little older now since I've been making these things, and I kind of think it's good for my hands because it keeps them limber. And my fingers are getting a little arthritic, but I still think it's more fun than, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing for my hands. almost ready to start. So I get it in a ball shape, which is getting close here. Oh, 
almost done. By almost done, I mean I like to get it quite symmetrical, so it looks like this size is about the size of a grapefruit. And some of my larger pots, I'll use a lot more clay than this. And I, and I don't do any coiling or slab building, which is another form of hand building. Um, and I, I am a little bit of a purist when it comes to pinch pots. I don't like to add clay beyond this ball. For example, this pot, which will become this clay, which will become a pot. So when I get it like this, which is pretty good, um, then I put my thumb right in the middle of the ball, like that, and push it out as hard as I can, like that. And there's a secret, you have to sort of keep turning it in one hand, hold it, turn it. You need to use both hands, and what, you can see why it's called a pinch pot because I'm pinching with my right hand and holding it in my left hand. It becomes a larger, a larger hole in the middle. And the secret to making a good pinch pot, it's probably true about any kind of pot, is that you want the walls to be uniformly thick. And so I can feel the inside and the outside as I do this. You can see the inside becoming a little bit larger. And I'm pulling it out a little bit with my thumb on the inside of the pot. I'm pushing down with my thumb as well. Pushing down, down, down. Feel the clay move. And then if you keep your hand on the bottom, it keeps the bottom of the pot round, which I like. I keep turning around and around. And I can kind of shape it as I go, like if it starts to flatten out a little bit on the bottom, I pat it again. reverse it and go this way. I keep feeling more and more areas where it needs to be thinned out. Sometimes I put more fingers on the inside to work on it on the inside, pushing it out. And you want to get the right, the clay to be the right um, softness and or level of um, moisture in the clay. If it gets too dry, it's harder to pinch. And also this clay is called, it's a kind of clay called Phoenix. That's the name brand, or uh, the name of the type of clay. It's good for the type of firing that I do which is raku or pit firing. Now I'm pushing the clay out more. If I want the pot to be taller, I wouldn't be pushing it out as much. This clay, this pot's gonna be a little bit more like a flatter, rounder, or flatter pot shape. And a person that influenced me quite a bit is a man named Paulus Berenson. He um, was a pinch potter and he taught a lot of classes at Penland. He was a very poetic kind of guy. And he's written a couple of books. One of them is called Finding One's Way with Clay. I've got more clay toward the top of this pot. So I'm going to go on the inside and just thin it out a little more. Paint. I used to be a painter before I moved to North Carolina. So I just sort of switched from being a painter to working with clay. And um, 
I've enjoyed it. I like the texture of it, and I used to enjoy painting a lot, but I, it's like a switch went off, and I decided I wanted to I would just work with clay. Like, and I do like to work with people in a group with clay. I've done, you know, taught a fair amount of pinch potting classes to people. Uh, it's good to leave a, enough clay at the top of the, at the rim so you can work with it and do something. You don't want to get too thin at the top, but I can feel it getting fairly thin. And it's still very flexible. I can do a lot with this pot, depending on, I can still change the shape quite a bit if I want to. thinned out a little bit more right up by the rim. Pretty soon I'll have to stop working on this and give it a break. If it gets too thin too quickly, it might collapse on itself. So when I want to break from my clay, which this pot is looking really nice. I, I, I like that it's, you know, it's, it's, you can sort of see. I, if I set it flat down, the bottom would go flat, which I don't like. I know some, my, some one of my kind of signature shapes as the bottoms are round. I like that a lot. So I have what I call it, I call this a nest. <laughs> and I rest it in there. And then it can stay in there. And also it gives me a rest from holding it a little bit too much. Your hands dry clay out, so if I keep touching it too much, it, it, the clay will get drier than I want it to be. It's a lot larger piece. And I've been I kept it wrapped in plastic so it wouldn't dry out because I was on vacation last week. But this has been resting quite a long time, and I like the shape of it quite a bit. And you can tell if you uh, can't hear it, but it's got a nice hollow ring to it. That's because I closed the top up so I could manipulate the shape more if you trap air inside. So I'm going to kind of leave it like that until I figure out. I, I have these paddles that I used, these, part of my equipment. <laughs> so, I can tap it a little bit here and there. And it reminds me a little bit of a torso of a person, uh, which is not what I was necessarily going for, but as I built it and let it take shape, I thought it has a bit of a personal look about it. So I'm going to wrap this one back up again and let it sit for a while. I will unwrap it and let it air dry with no wrapping around it and it will probably take about a, several days for it to dry. It has to be completely dry before I put it in the electric kiln to bisque fire it. And I usually put something on it called carrot sidge before I fire it. This is a pot that I consider the shape is done finished. And this started just like that when I was just working on. Except this is completely dry and if you felt inside you could tell the interior walls are nice and thin. This is quite a traditional shape that I make. Um, a lot of my signature pots take on a form quite a bit like this. My taller pots, like the ones I'm working on, are more recent rendition of my work. Another thing I like about a lot of my pieces are the negative spaces. I like to look inside and I like the shape. I, I don't necessarily go for a uniformly exact round opening. So this is just a little bit off, which is asymmetrical. And then this one I made, which is similar to that one over there. This is just trying to say, pull the clay in more and I also had enclosed it so I could manipulate. I, I trapped air inside so you can move the clay around. The next step I would do before I bisque fire this in the electric kiln is I'll put terra sidge on it, which is kind of a very, something like a slip, it's almost like a watered down clay you paint on this. And sometimes like those pieces over there are blue, I'll put a little, blue stain or some other color stain in it to give it, just give it a little color. 
and um, that gives that generally makes the surface a little smoother. So when I smoke fire it, the smoke is more likely to adhere to the surface. Because I fired this in a garbage can, <laughs> and I like it a lot. I mean, I, I'm ne I will never. Sometimes I get very attached to my work, and this one I'm particularly attached to. Well, I really like the shape, and I like the color. I, this one I named Gospel Pot because it's, I sing in a gospel choir, it's an interracial choir, and when I made this, I was just thinking about the choir a lot, and it is black and white. And not intentionally, I mean, this, the thing about atmospheric firing is you don't, get to say much about the outcome of it. Um, this I fired in a garbage can too, and I, I actually, this is a much different shape than usual. This is a combination of pinch and some coil, actually, on the top. The woman I learned this from was um, teaching about Nigerian pottery, and this is a shape that's similar to Nigerian pots. It's a little, just the rubbing on it with a silver spoon. So that's what that is. And you can see it's some, there's a fern. I put ferns in the pot, in the pit too, so you'll see. It's another gift from the fire. Just the chemical, you know, like copper that was, I put some copper pipes in the fire, old copper pipes. And my pot just turned out so nice. The following video is a pit fire I did with some students from the Korean um, student group who come to Frank. The first thing I do is put the pieces in a pit with wood chips. You will see us uh, dumping wood chips on top of the pots. And you might have noticed before the pots are covered there, we put several organic um, materials on the top, organic meaning things like banana peels and orange peels. And the reason we do that is they leave interesting marks on pots. We also put ferns um, on the pieces. So, and um, I will show you a piece at, at the end of the video of how it turned out. So we layer the pots in many, many layers of wood chips. And as we put the wood chips in, we also put lots of lighter fuel in um, so that the, the fire burns all the way down. You also see us putting hay in the pit. The hay is really interesting. Uh, it makes really it can make very interesting marks on um, pit fired pieces. And so there, I'm putting more um, lighter fuel in. After we get the pots layered in the pit, we put pieces of newspaper, wadded up newspaper. We continue to put newspaper on. Lots and lots of newspaper wadded up. I have a lot of good helpers today. Here I'm putting, starting the fire after we've also put on pieces of kindling. The fire has to be lit on all sides to make sure it burns in every nook and cranny of the pit. This is it. One of the more exciting times of pit firing. I'm stirring the top of the fire so that it flattens out. We need it flat so we can put these big, large pieces of tin on the very top. And we need it to be flat. The Korean students are doing a wonderful job of helping me out. We have it almost covered. By this time, it's very hot and smoky. Smoke keeps billowing out as we continue to attempt to cover it up and smother the pit as much as possible.
this is a piece that was in the pit fire that you just saw. And you can see um, a beautiful shadowy piece, uh, fern image on here that was in the pit. And then around this side, you can see a few little images of some just kind of little specks of hay. And these stripes, they aren't really stripes, but they're subtle shadowy pieces. This is from the banana peel that was in the pit. And so it's kind of a black and gray and um, blue piece. And it's kind of abstractish looking because, uh, you know, if you were a painter and you tried to paint it like that, it, you know, it would, you might like that and leave it that way. But this is, this is the magic of the fire. You never know what it's going to do. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I'm so intrigued with pit firing happy accidents that happen. The green is from the sigillatus, and there's little specks on here, and I think that was from the hay. You can see little images that um, was just a lovely little image from the pieces of hay that were in the pit. And then the back side is just a typical smoky um, color from the, from the fire. Marks here are from the hay that was in the pit fire. And so this is a very nice piece of very, I think, very elegant pot that has lots of nice images from the pit fire. And the little jagged pieces are the hay marks. And by the way, my hat <laughs> has a little, has a decor decoration itself because I took a spill and broke a bone in my thumb. So I have it in this pretty purple cast for a, a few weeks. So it's going to slow me down from doing my pinch pots, as you saw in the video earlier. I usually need both hands. So until this is healed, I won't be doing a lot of uh, pinch pots. I may um, try working with one hand to see what I can do during this one hand pinch pot period of mine. <laughs> but...